Good morning to those of you joining us from Europe and Africa. Good afternoon to those of you in Asia. Um, I'm Lars Hagenbuch. I'm a member of the Rescura team in London. And together with my colleague Robin Yu in Hong Kong, um, we would like to take the next hour to guide you through the results of our um, Moving the Needle Stewardship Survey that we've recently completed among Chinese asset managers. Um, and the survey is itself a follow-on to a similar one we completed for the South African markets uh, last year. Um, <clears throat> before we get going, just a couple of admin announcements. Um, the webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available to uh, the attendees afterwards. Um, if you'd like to submit a question, uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, please submit that uh, question through that uh, function. And uh, we've left some time at the end to uh, try and answer as many questions as possible. And um, if you have an issue with uh, technology or anything like that, then please use the, the chat function and uh, somebody on our side will, uh, will try and uh, assist you. So um, <clears throat> first off, um, an introduction on uh, Riscura. Um, for those of you who are less familiar with us as a firm, we're one of the largest emerging and frontier markets consulting and advisory firms. Um, we offer services to asset owners, investment managers, service providers across the industry, advising on over 165 billion in assets. Um, and since we started taking an interest in China uh, almost 10 years ago, we've helped clients allocate more than a billion dollars to the region, including an $800 million pooled equity fund, which has uh, delivered uh, great results for investors since it was launched just over three and a half years ago. Um, so why have we done this survey? Um, one of our guiding principles as a firm is to invest with care. Um, and in today's context, uh, the context of the survey, um, it, it means deepening our understanding and the, the industry's understanding of steering global capital towards investments that benefit society and the planet uh, in, in the long term. So we care very much about stewardship. Um, we should probably define what we mean by stewardship before we get going. Um, and we've, we've put a definition up here on the, on the slide. Um, it's, it's to use the influence of institutional investors to maximize the long-term value, uh, including value of uh, economic, social, environmental assets, um, as well as returns on, on clients and ultimately beneficiaries' interest. So it's, it's important because stewardship is one of the most effective tools with which to minimize the, the risk, the long-term risk, preserving the long-term shareholder value, and enhancing long-term returns of the assets which we as uh, members of the industry as, as custodians of uh, beneficiaries funds are entrusted with. So asset managers have a really important role to play as stewards and they are really the people in the front line who engage with corporates, who, who set some of the agendas on uh, shareholder resolutions at AGMs and so forth. Um, they're the ones who engage with CEOs and CFOs uh, where a lot of these decisions are ultimately made. Um, China has become a much more important part of people's portfolios um, over the last couple of years. Um, so if we go back to say sort of early 2019, when uh, the, the, the mainland Chinese market first started becoming part of the uh, MSCI indices and indeed other index providers indices as well. At the time, really China was equal to Hong Kong um, and the Hong Kong market has been available for a long time already. And it's, it's reasonably familiar to many investors, but the mainland market was quite restrictive, even though the, the uh, stock exchanges started reopening in about 1990. Um, it took many years before foreigners were really able to participate in that market. And then uh, as time has progressed, the uh, proportion of the mainland uh, holdings that have been included in the indices has increased. Um, there are still some reasons why um, that full inclusion has not been uh, implemented as yet, including ownership restrictions on the mainland, as well as some technical factors around uh, settlements. But if we had the, uh, the mainland uh, assets uh, at their full weight, then um, it would be uh, approximately half of the, uh, the total emerging markets index. And that's really because the Chinese market in the 30 years that it's been reopened has grown to become the second largest equity market, both by market cap and by turnover in the world, second only to the United States. Now, um, even if we don't necessarily have direct exposure to Chinese assets through an explicit Chinese allocation, um, we almost certainly have a fairly large amount of indirect exposure to Chinese assets. So what we've put up on this, the page here is a, a selection of sort of fairly familiar US listed companies. 
Um, and the, the orange bars indicate the percentage of revenues of sales that these companies derive from China. Um, so, you know, if we kind of look through the list there, there's uh, a Texas Instruments, a large American semiconductor company that uh, generates, you know, almost half of its revenues from China. Qualcomm, it's more than 60%. Wynn Resorts, perhaps a surprising entry on the list here, uh, perhaps, you know, more familiar as a, a casino operator in Las Vegas, but they actually generate almost three quarters of their total revenue from China because of a large presence in Macau, which is a big gaming center just off the coast of mainland China. Uh, but even European companies, Volkswagen, they sell approximately 11 cars a minute in China. So it's very important as a market for the companies that we probably are invested in. And therefore, any risk that is associated with China will impact these global companies. Um, you know, the, 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 the question of stewardship doesn't extend only to Chinese listed companies. It also extends to companies that operate within China that generate revenues from China. Um, now, before diving into the survey itself, we probably need to do, take a few minutes to just sketch the, the, the broad uh, background to ESG factors and the development of that in China. Um, so, I mean, our process has always been quite aware of responsible investing, even before those labels were, were popular. Um, what's really important for us is, is we look for actions rather than words or reports or affiliations. Um, we, we have a very strong preference for engagement over exclusion. Basically, we want to see the asset managers that we work with, that we recommend for our clients to actually get involved with the underlying corporates to, to make a difference, to try to move the needle forward, hence the name of our survey. Um, the ESG in China um, has grown in importance rapidly in the last couple of years. Um, you know, we need to understand that it, it remains a, a command economy um, it is run very differently to Western democracies that we might be more familiar with. Um, but one of the impacts of, of being a command economy is that the acceptance of malpractice, for example, can be very short-lived. If companies do something which the state disagrees with or which are prejudicial to, to the local population, um, swift action can be taken and that can have an, an immediate and very material impact on the fortunes of those companies. Um, and so local asset managers have paid significant attention to these factors, these unsusta potentially unsustainable practices uh, for some time. Um, so the whole idea of, of ESG factor investing is not really new to them, even if the label was something that, they, that they're only recently uh, coming to terms with. Um, and because it's off what we would consider a lower base, um, the rate of change is often as important as anything. So what is and one of the things too that came through on our survey was that um, the, the direction of travel is really what we should be looking at. You know, how can we assist managers? Are they making progress? Um, are there tangible results that they've, uh, that they've already come through? Um, and then one other thing that we'll get to in a minute on in terms of the survey itself is um, it, it was clear to us from the interviews we did that regulators have a very profound impact on how the Chinese market operates. Um, on whether there's reporting or whether there's engagement, on the type of reporting and engagement, these are strongly influenced by the actions of, uh, of regulators. Um, the other thing we should just take a few minutes to understand is the various markets for Chinese equities. Um, because there are three primary areas where Chinese securities are listed or where access to Chinese securities can be found, um, through the Hong Kong market, through the mainland, and then through particularly the US depository receipts, although there are also depository receipts in, in other countries. Um, Hong Kong has been around for a long time, um, since the late 1800s. It's a market that's been invested by Westerners for a long time. Um, it's characterized by a fairly high level of minority shareholder protection. So the legal system in Hong Kong is quite strong. Um, for example, the, uh, you know, if, if you as a, a minority shareholder um, are faced with a, some corporate reorganization or action that you are uh, uncomfortable with, you don't agree with, then as a dissenting shareholder, you can force the company to repurchase your shares if they go ahead with the action. Or the courts can be asked to set aside uh, un unfavorable resolutions that are prejudicial to groups of shareholders. So there's very strong minority shareholder protection built into Hong Kong. Um, and one of the things that we learned through speaking to the managers as part of the survey is that these, these very strong minority protections actually influence whether companies list themselves in Hong Kong. So particularly companies that might have a very strong founding family with a strong amount of influence by those founders, they will choose a, a regime that is you know, as permissive to them <clears throat> to continue while, while still being listed. And they might find themselves listing 
through US ADRs, which of the three is arguably the weakest in terms of minority protection. But it'll be interesting to see where, how that trend develops since there has been some well-documented action by the SEC to make uh, US ADRs more compliant with, with domestic US regulations. And that, that has seen a shift of, uh, of listings back to Hong Kong. But more on that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> the main bulk of the listed shares is actually through the mainland. More than 80% of the total market cap is on the mainland. Um, the basic rules here are actually quite similar to what they are in Hong Kong or elsewhere in the West. Um, but some areas are still under development. Um, we would consider the minority shareholder protection to be adequate. Um, <clears throat> as an example, um, we mentioned Stock Connect here. Stock Connect is a, a settlements program that was enacted between the mainland exchanges and the Hong Kong Clearinghouse uh, a couple of years ago that really revolutionized the way that foreigners can purchase shares on the mainland. It made it much easier, quotas were removed, uh, the, the whole settlements process is now very familiar. But one of the impacts of using Stock Connect is that it's actually the Hong Kong clearinghouse that becomes the shareholder of record. Now, if you then, as the beneficiary of these shares, wanted to bring legal action against the directors, even though that may be permissible under Chinese law, you would need the cooperation of the Hong Kong clearinghouse to bring that action. And while the Hong Kong Clearinghouse has publicly stated it will, uh, it will support shareholders in those actions, um, it may well be that its appetite for bringing a particular case is different to what uh, the shareholders, the beneficial owners might be. And therefore there will be these areas where um, you know, the legal system just hasn't been tested yet, where there is no precedent, it's not clear how uh, things might end up. But nevertheless, the, 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 the underlying Chinese law is actually very similar to what it is in the West. The protections are actually very, very similar. Um, last on the list is the US um, ADRs. Uh, these are very convenient because they trade just like other securities, but they're not actually shares. So to be clear, uh, a depository receipt is something which is uh, issued by a depository bank. The depository bank purchases the shares. It then gives you essentially a, a, a deposit, a little piece of paper that says, you know, yes, um, you know, you can kind of get the economic benefits of this. But you're not actually the shareholder. And so there's relatively minimal shareholder, minority shareholder protection. If you are upset about something, then you would basically need the depository bank to bring legal action on your behalf. And they may not really be willing to do that. And uh, as I say, as a result, the, the protection is quite, is quite weak, but it's very convenient, which is why uh, ADRs continue to be popular among uh, investors. So <clears throat> diving into the survey itself now, um, <clears throat> we, we canvassed a a total of uh, 41 asset managers, uh, or at least 41 asset managers responded to our survey. Um, <clears throat> the, we identified sort of six key themes. Um, I'm gonna cover the sort of the first half of those and uh, Robin will look, uh, look at the second half of those, um, as well as looking at the implications for portfolio performance um, of uh, some of the findings of that survey. So first off, the first conclusion, perhaps not surprisingly, is that stewardship uh, is improving, uh, is improving rapidly, uh, but it is off a low base. So the concept of stewardship is still in the early stages of development for many managers. Progress is in the right direction. As I said, things have improved rapidly. Um, it came as a slight surprise to us, a pleasant surprise to us that uh, 28 out of the 41 managers that responded already admitted to being uh, PRI. So that's the, the uh, principles for responsible investing signatories. Um, and, and indeed, there were a handful of managers where it was very clear that they have fully embraced stewardship, they have fully embraced their responsibilities as uh, responsible investors, they're on par with uh, global best practice. Um, for others, yes, there was work still to be done, uh, but there was growing awareness, um, a lot of that is because of the increased foreign and institutional shareholding of Chinese equities, um, and particularly the foreign uh, investors, they of course bring with them demands for reporting, demands for engagement, which they are familiar with in their home markets, um, and they will then project that onto their Chinese asset managers. Uh, asset managers. Um, there has been a growing focus on sustainability and ESG factors as part of government policy, um, and particularly as the government aims to transition the economy from more of a quantity, so just producing stuff for the rest of the world, to a quality. Um, making higher quality products, quality products for domestic consumers, um, but also a very strong focus on the environment uh, within the, uh, among the regulators. So again, a number of managers made it very clear to us that the, uh, the Chinese government's net zero target by 2060 has had a material impact on 
the type of reporting they can get back from uh, companies, the type of uh, issues that companies are willing to engage on. Um, a large number, more than three quarters of the managers we surveyed uh, reported that they already have an engagement policy in place. Although it was clear in speaking to them through the interviews afterwards that sometimes that was more on paper than, than in reality. Um, nevertheless, there was uh, receptiveness to guidance. Um, but as I mentioned previously, because the, uh, the market overall, the economy overall, is still very command driven, it, it, a lot of managers admitted that it was up to policymakers to drive really meaningful change. That in order for companies to, to fully embrace the reporting obligations that we might expect of them or to be willing to engage with, uh, with asset owners, um, it was really up to policymakers to give guidance and to set rules which once they were enforced, then the level of compliance was generally quite high. So another thing that we, uh, we perhaps not surprisingly discovered through the survey is that, you know, once there is a rule in place, then, you know, the, the, the willingness of managers or companies to uh, comply with that was very strong. The punishment was often quite severe and there was nothing to be gained from, um, from avoiding an obligation that was put upon you by, by regulators. Um, so as I said before, um, we were pleasantly surprised that a number of uh, managers were already signatories to the PRI. Um, we asked them about a, a number of other uh, global initiatives where there was some, some resonance for a handful of those, particularly on the climate side, and perhaps a little bit less so uh, around the kind of labor standards and, um, uh, and some of the um, uh, sort of human rights issues, which is a bit of a sensitive issue in China. Um, Robin will touch on that again a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> as we were surveying through the managers, we, we divided the group into four primary headings. Um, the first was what we would describe as global managers. So these are multinational asset management firms. They, they operate globally. Um, they either have uh, uh, regional or even in-country in China teams who manage Chinese portfolios. Um, actually, increasingly, what one of the things we learned through the survey was that um, regulations have liberated over the last recent, I'm going to say year or year and a half, um, which have made it easier for a global asset manager to set up a domestic Chinese operation. And a number of large asset managers have taken advantage of that. They now have in-country teams. Um, but because these global managers cater to a global client base, they will be very familiar with the amount of reporting, <clears throat> the type of engagement that is expected of them uh, by their underlying uh, asset owners and underlying beneficiaries. So they, perhaps not surprisingly, will, will, will turn out to be the ones who have the most well-developed uh, programs when it comes to responsible investing. Um, and then the, the, the local managers, we categorize those into three primary groups. Um, the, the first and largest by assets under management will be uh, domestic mutual fund managers. So these are unit trust managers that manage primarily retail uh, assets. They will be significant in size. You know, many will manage several hundreds of billions of dollars for a large number of domestic clients. Um, but many of their products will be strongly tailored towards the uh, retail client base. And one of the issues of, of that, as they uh, made clear to us, is that that does lead them to a degree of short-termism. Um, and again, we'll explore what that means for engagement in, in a second. Um, and then we have two types of local boutiques. The boutiques are generally the smaller asset managers with uh, a local operation. Occasionally, they'll have a Hong Kong operation as well. Um, but we, we distinguish here between those that have foreign clients and those that don't have foreign clients. Um, and then, as we can see on the following page, um, we ask those managers in those various groups to self-score themselves on their own stewardship performance. And um, as we can see, the global managers they gave themselves the highest score. Um, you know, they, they sort of thought, well, you know, about eight out of 10 is about the ranking. And the domestic mutual funds, much to their credit, um, admitted that you know, their own practices were perhaps not as well developed as they could be. And then in between, we had the two boutiques. Um, now, interestingly, the, the, the boutique with, local, with, the, with foreign managers actually scored themselves slightly lower than the onshore boutiques. And we, we suspect that that may well be because, because they have foreign clients, they are more exposed to the demands of foreign investors They perhaps are more aware of, of shortcomings. Whereas some of the onshore boutiques, if you don't have a foreign client, you perhaps have not been exposed to those questions in, in, in quite the same way. Um, when looking at these numbers, just bear in mind, this is a self-score. 
So it's going to be biased. It's unlikely that any manager would score themselves particularly poorly. I know I would am unlikely to score myself poorly if, if asked to, to do so in a survey. Um, and they also were scoring themselves really relative to the industry, relative to their peers. So, you know, if, if we were to rephrase the question to say, you know, in absolute terms, how do you think your, your stewardship performance compares to, say, you know, global best practice, then we would expect these, uh, these numbers to be uh, rather lower than, uh, than they were. Um, I'm going to hand over to Robin now to, to take you through um, the kind of cultural and, and other learnings from the survey. Um, and then um, I'll, I'll come back on at the end and just sort of wrap things up for you. So thank you, Robin. Thank you very much, Lars. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to present today. Let me first continue with our key findings from the survey, and then I will explain why stewardship and ESG considerations matter in China from a financial perspective. In China, engagement practices are impacted by cultural nuances. Our research found that um, domestic managers don't like going public about their disagreements with corporates or even voting against a resolution. As the chart here shows, managers prefer communicating with corporates behind closed doors. Even letters to the board or CEO are not much used. Confrontational engagements such as proxy fights are almost non-existent in the Chinese market. The reason here is conflict avoidance, uh, which is an unavoidable part of Asian and particularly Chinese culture. Conflicts are often perceived as trouble and disrespect, but there are also practical reasons, as managers explained. They are afraid of losing future corporate access and also having a troublemaker reputation in the industry. Many managers indicated that they're more likely to sell their shares than engage in a prolonged activism. We believe that this is not the best way of contributing to improving stewardship in the long run. This is an area where Chinese practices differ from other markets where proxy fights and lawsuits are much more common. Short-termism is a major obstacle worldwide to the asset management industry and limits effective stewardship. It is a bigger issue in China as over 70% of the market turnover is driven by retail trading. Managers with domestic retail products are the most effective, uh, affected as their client base evaluate um, their performance based on one single metric, which is the short term, uh, i.e. three to 12 months performance. This invites short-sighted decisions, including not, only, uh, including not doing enough with stewardship. Chinese managers reported that operational and financial issues such as business strategy and capital allocation policy remain the uh, main areas of focus for engagement. At the same time, ESG issues are a growing topic due to increasing awareness and demand from investors. About 70% of the managers that we surveyed provided ESG engagement example from last year. Chinese managers are exploring new ways of engagement. About 30% of respondents have collaborated with other asset managers or asset owners with some successful engagement cases. And about 20% of them have used a specialist engagement service provider. ESG considerations are no longer new to China. They have received growing regulatory and investor attention. We summarize our findings as what was G is now ESG. Please note the smaller S uh, there as we will explain. In emerging markets, the risk of governance failure is usually higher than in developed markets. Specific to China, this is a consequence of relative newness, newness of its capital markets and the prevalence, uh, prevalence of large controlling shareholders usually either the state, a founding person, or their family, who can make or break a company. The positive examples would be Elon Musk to Tesla or uh, Mark Zuckerberg to Facebook, but even those have their own risks. On the flip side, many companies with concentrated ownership 
uh, run for the benefit of the majority shareholder at the expense of minority shareholders. Therefore, Chinese managers always pay a great deal of attention to corporate uh, governance factors, not only for identifying the best run companies, but also to avoid the, the, the traps. The development in Yi is benefiting from the state objectives. China will play a significant role in combating climate change globally. It is the largest carbon emitter in the world. The government has committed itself to achieve carbon peak by 2035 and carbon neutrality by 2060. This will create both investment opportunities and potential traps to investors. While social factors have become more important in recent years, they are relatively complex and less developed. Engagement on social issues require uh, particular cultural considerations with many managers deferring to the state. However, that does not mean social issues are less important. In fact, managers reported that many recent significant share price moves were caused by policy changes that are related to social objectives at the state level. We will discuss some of them in the next section. Managers also pointed out that most social issues such as human rights in China are very specific and localized and therefore avoidable for foreign investors investing in China. Uh, one last point to make here is changes in regulation can be very swift and substantial. Managers need to stay attuned to policy direction, which we think that local managers have an advantage over the global peers. The key ESG issues in China, some are quite similar to the Western uh, world and other EMs, such as climate change and emissions, while some other reflects, uh, reflect local concerns. For example, pollution and waste management are important environmental issues in China, given they were poorly managed in the past. Under social, product safety and liability, and em employee health and safety are the top issues to monitor and engage on. Human rights is replaced by data privacy as a top three forward-looking issue, probably, probably because there have been some data private, uh, privacy issues just happened recently, and it's still very fresh memory for, for, for the managers. For, govern for governance issues, many are equally important to managers, in addition to the three that is listed here. Another key finding from our research was that ESG disclosure and data quality in China have gradually improved over the years. Managers reported seeing a growing number of companies making voluntary filings of sustainability reports. However, overall standards and willingness of disclosures are still lacking the developed markets. Currently, E and S disclosures are not mandatorily required for all companies. Managers expect substantive uh, progress only once policymakers enforce compulsory disclosures. This is already underway as regulators are speeding up their work on disclosure rules. For example, mandatory disclosures are already required for major polluters and will apply to all in the coming years. Hong Kong, on the other hand, is already leading the regulatory progress in the APEC region. Our research also showed that most Chinese managers keep a record of the engagement activities, but many of them do not report externally. Managers with better ESG transparency said that they are able to build closer relationships with clients, which benefits them commercially. Managers also gave examples of how both good and poor ESG communications can be consequential to corporates. For example, uh, SF Holding, a leading Chinese logistics company, was rated triple C by MSCI last year. With the help from multiple investors on disclosure, the company has been upgraded to double B this year. On the other hand, the consequences of poor investor communication can be significant. Li Ning, a Chinese sportswear maker, was put on Norges Bank's exclusion list as the company did not respond to requests for ESG information.
proxy voting works in China, but it could be more useful. Managers confirm that proxy voting system in China is effective and reliable. However, not all managers vote on all issues or at all meetings. Even few report their activities to asset owners. Also, it seems that shareholders do not use abstention much as a subtle message to management. In terms of making proxy decisions, while some managers use advice from a proxy service provider, no managers outsource discretion to vote to a third party. We note that voting agencies are starting to emerge. They can actually help anonymize the votes so managers are not being publicly seen to challenge the corporates. In the survey, the question of effectiveness of the industry's proxy voting on ESG issues was mostly given a rating between two to four, uh, five being highly effective, the most effective here, on all the issues, indicating moderate effectiveness and there's room for improvement. Most respondents said that they exercise proxy voting, while six respondents admitted they do not. Not required by regulations or law is the most cited reason for not to vote followed by limited staff and resources. Other reasons include that this is not important and limited demand from clients. So what are the implications for our investment portfolios? Number one, the policy decisions can have immediate and substantial impact to companies and even entire industries. As Lars mentioned, China is a command-driven economy where the government has the ability to implement changes over very short periods, periods of time. One very relevant example is the government's clampdown on air pollution after the 2008 Beijing Olympics. The picture on the left is what daytime in Beijing used to look like, compared to today on the right. The clean air initiatives led to the shutdown of the most polluting companies in the steel, cement, and other industries. But it also left the best run companies consolidating and increasing their market share in the industry. Winners and losers can be very significant. Here are more recent examples of how unsustainable business practices impact share price performance negatively. Whether it's data privacy concerns on DD, a ride hailing app, or social issues arising from after school tutoring, um, tele education on top right was one of the largest operators in the, in the sector, or antitrust issues on Alibaba or labor rights protection for delivery riders of Meituan, the largest food delivery platform in the country. You can see the large and sharp drawdowns and in the case of tele education, the entire fortune was gone. There are investment, there are investment winners at the same time. In this chart, we show the share price performance of three major Chinese cement producers. There was not much differentiation in the first half of the period. Things changed after the government stepped up effort on closing polluting sites and reducing excess capacity since 2013. Anhui Conch, a portfolio holding across many of our portfolio managers, doubled its, ship, uh, doubled its market share as the company continued to invest in technology to stay efficient and compliant to more stringent environmental regulations, leading to very strong investment returns. Past events are strong evidence that researching and preempting ESG risks is vital for successful Chinese investment strategy, not only to avoid unsustainable ESG practices in the first place, it also helps to identify winners when entire sectors are out of favor. 
The table shows significant drawdowns in the share prices of some of the best quality Chinese companies after new regulations in the sectors. However, in most cases, it did not take too long for their share prices to recover and continue to make new highs. Good fund managers can take advantage of these abnormal um, opportunities. As an emerging market, China needs continuous reform to sustain economic growth. And these reforms have cycles. Policy tightening usually happens when economy is doing well and vice versa. The most recent cycle started in July last year has already come to an end earlier this year. Regulatory reform also brings tailwinds and opportunities. The renewable energy and electric vehicle sectors are good examples. Therefore, deep insights are needed to avoid traps and find opportunities for asset managers. Some closing thoughts before we open the floor for questions. Um, stewardship is improving rapidly off a low base. Regulators play a key role in China. ESG factors can have outsized portfolio impact. We need local managers to find the right opportunities. Stewardship should matter to all asset owners and asset managers. But as we have seen here, the impact of getting it right can be very significant in China. Last, back to you. Uh, thank, thanks, Robin. Um, yeah, so I think what we've seen through the, the survey and also some of the, uh, the charts that Robin showed is that um, responsible investing has been an issue for uh, Chinese asset managers for a long time. We go back to that example of the Beijing Olympics. I mean, that, that was almost 15 years ago. And there already, 15 years ago, there was an example where an ESG issue, in this case, an environmental issue, uh, resulted in policy, resulted in a significant uh, share price movement for uh, the, the companies that were affected, uh, whether they were pollute, you know, polluting industries that were nearby, um, and there were very clear winners and losers that uh, emerged from that. So asset managers in China have a long history of having to deal with these sort of issues, these deal with these sort of problems. Um, but you know, as, we've, as we learned through the survey and I've, I've tried to discuss today, um, their, their formal incorporation of these factors uh, is, is really what's missing as opposed to an awareness and understanding of that. Um, so with that, um, thanks Robin for, for the, uh, taking us through that part of the survey. And we do have a couple of questions that, uh, have come through. Um, <clears throat> one of the questions has, that's come through is in, in terms of the key ESG issues that managers care about, um, were there any material differences between what we identified in the Chinese survey uh, versus uh, what we might have, uh, find in other, might have found in other countries? I, I mentioned we've done a similar survey for South Africa previously. Um, so at a high level, the, the issues on the environmental side were actually you know, almost identical. Everyone is, is well aware of carbon emissions and pollution as, uh, as top factors. Um, on the, the social element uh, in uh, the Chinese survey, uh, issues of, of gender and race diversity were uh, not nearly as important as they might have been elsewhere. Um, you know, the, the society in China is, is a little bit more homo uh, homogeneous than it might be. Um, but you know, perhaps also that is a, a sensitive topic that managers were, were less willing to, uh, to, to put their hand up and say this is something that we can engage on going forward. And on the governance side, actually, the, the factors that we ranked in this survey in China, they were all really uh, of the same order of magnitude. So there wasn't really much to choose uh, between the governance factors in, in the first place. Um, we've then also had a second question uh, whether we can just elaborate a little bit more on the controlling shareholder point. Uh, there was a description we made earlier about um, how the newness of the market matters, like well, what, what, what impact that, that has on, uh, on the, the issue of controlling shareholders. So um, I think Robin gave the example of um, Tesla as, as a, a company. I, I suspect that a number of investors into Tesla, they really are buying into Elon Musk. And um, the, the, the issue of controlling shareholder and the influence that they can have on the, the financial results and the share price performance of those companies, that's not unusual. That's nothing that is, uh, doesn't exist elsewhere in the world. 
Um, but what is a little bit different about China is because the capital markets themselves are quite new, companies haven't really had a chance to, to sort of cycle through uh, generations of shareholders yet. So it's, it's still the founders who are in charge or their families who are in charge, um, as opposed to a, a broadly diversified range of shareholders, which you tend to get once the first, you know, the second or third generation of the company founders has gone through that they've sold off bits and pieces over the years, they've expanded, they've raised capital, and you have a much, much wider shareholder base. So if your shareholder base is still quite concentrated, then the issues of, you know, who is the founder and the governance issues, they become much more important. And so in China, all that's different there between the, 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 that market and other markets is, is simply the number of companies that are still in this early stage where um, the, the founder has such a profound impact on the, on the overall outcome. Um, and then uh, one other question we had was um, how representative we thought the survey is. Um, I'll, I'll give Robin a chance to just say a little bit more about the size of the market, but really our, our intention here was to, to try to, to survey a representative number of managers across the various market segments. Robin, I think is it what we have almost is it five thousand managers in China more or less at the moment. Um, so it's a very very large sample, a very large uh, universe. That's right. Yeah. So especially on for the onshore boutiques, uh, it's close to nine thousand onshore boutiques. But uh, uh, so it's very disproportional um, among the different groups different types of managers that we that we uh, that we showed there but the objective here is to be as representative as possible and hence we try to you know break the different managers depending on their client base depending on their um, uh, 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 background into different groups and have us you know a, 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 a big enough number um, of um, respondents from each group um, to, to put together this survey. I think Riskira has a unique position in the industry to do that, um, partially, you know, because we are allocator ourselves. We, we also, you know, investment consultant that been researching China for a long time. So we have developed all these relationships with Chinese managers over the past seven to eight years. So which um, makes, uh, makes us, um, um, I haven't been able to uh, put this together. Um, actually, many, uh, it's interesting that some of the managers even ask us not to disclose the names because some of the information are quite sensitive and, you know, um, they don't want to um, uh, be, be published, and, but they will try to give us the most honest answers to the survey. Uh, yeah, thanks, Robin. Um... So we've had another question to do with greenwashing, um, whether there, whether we have concerns with greenwashing in the way that uh, companies are going about pretending, claiming to have uh, environmentally friendly products or services, um, or, or misreporting their uh, in, uh, carbon footprint. I think there was a well-documented case not not too long ago where um, the chief executive of uh, DWS, uh, Deutsche Wertpapierspan, a, a unit of Deutsche Bank asset management uh, unit, uh, the chief executive actually was forced out because uh, they discovered that there had been some misreporting mis on the uh, um, environmental credentials of some of the funds that they were running. Um, is that an issue? Do we think that that's an issue, Robin, uh, among Chinese companies, the managers, that they say anything about that? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a global issue. Uh, greenwashing. I think uh, China is it's really it's at the early development of 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 uh, you know ESG and stewardship. Um, so I think at this stage it's we 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 would closely monitor the rate of change, and I think it's more important that you know the uh, the managers have uh, the awareness and um, and start incorporating ESG and stewardship into the investment process. But some of these um, greenwashing issues uh, are, you know, um, uh, exist in the market. For example, uh, some if you look at some ESG prod, uh, ESG funds um, provided by some some of the largest um, domestic mutual funds, uh, you know, if you look at the top holdings, uh, 
some some of the holdings you would question um, from a year's perspective why they would uh, be in the portfolio. Um, uh, it's only because that they have very good um, ESG rating by third party, but um, there's um, uh, you know uh, there's public concerns and and you know concerns that um, uh, that investors um, uh, would know um, you know whether it's environmental or social um, that wouldn't make them qualified. But uh, it's still very much now, uh, you know, the, the criteria, um, the selection process is, um, you know, purely based on, you know, ESG rate and well, then there's a fundamental overlay to the process. So this is one example of greenwashing. Um, and this, this is something that, you know, um, as stewardship and ESG develops in China, we expect, you know, investors and regulators will find way to tackle you know, by increasing the data quality, transparency, and also having more tools to, to uh, evaluate um, companies' um, uh, progress, uh, corporate progress in terms of um, their, their uh, ESG developments. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we've had another question, which, which I suspect is something that um, is of, of interest to a number of attendees today, um, which is to do with whether we can really separate the ESG considerations from the, the company level at the, the, the country level. Um, there have been documented uh, issues and cases where the Chinese government has uh, some human rights problems. Um, you know, is it possible to ever truly invest responsibly in a landscape like that? Um, you know, or what, what is the best that one can do under those circumstances, given the, the degree of uh, business uh, of government involvement with business in China. Um, I'm going to give a, a partial answer to that and then give Robin a chance to add to that as well. Um, so the, the sort of two things that come to my mind uh, straight off are that um, we as a firm believe fairly strongly in, and I, I suppose I, you know, I'm admitting a small personal bias here as well, in, in engagement over exclusion. So if you're not present at the table, then almost certainly you're not making any difference to the underlying outcomes, whether that be you know, how workers are treated, product safety, who's making your products, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, if, if someone is not involved, is not invested, then you, know, you have no voice at all. So certainly it would be preferable to, to be engaged, um, you know, even if the change that is made is, is small and is progressive over time, <clears throat> at least there is change that is in a positive direction. Um, and the other thing which, uh, you know, we did ask a question like this to a couple of the managers. Um, and a, a response there was that, you know, they actually care about these issues almost as much as we do. Um, and there are, because the market is so, is so large, there are a large number of alternative opportunities that one can progress. So it's not necessarily such that, you know, all portfolios in China are going to have exposure to the problemat more problematic regions. Um, and that's, in fact, with careful research, with picking the right partners, with picking the right managers, um, a portfolio can be can, can avoid areas of problem um, and can make a, a positive difference. I don't know, Robin, is there anything you wanted to add to add to that? Yeah, Lars, I think you covered it. Covered it. Maybe just one more point is, I think what is um, uh, uh, important to the state uh, in terms of the social objectives might be different to what the Western countries uh, would like to see. Like for example, uh, it, it was almost a miracle that China, you know, the Chinese government pulled you know, uh, majority, most of the population out of poverty in just 30, 40 years of time. Um, this is a big you know, social um, achievement uh, in human history. Um, and also, you know, there's been also recent cases of um, addressing social issues arising from, you know, private tutoring, uh, after school private tutoring with, uh, or antitrust, as I, as I mentioned. So um, the government has, you know, a set of objectives that they want to address, but at the same time, you know, it, 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 you know we need to, um, uh, and, and this is no different from other countries and, and it requires some adaption to local conditions and, and, and beliefs. Thanks, Robin. Um, we, we've had a, a related question, which was to for us to, I guess, clarify 
you know, why we spelled ESG with a small s uh, when it came to uh, the Chinese survey and the Chinese market. And um, again, I'll, I'll, I'll have a go at an answer and give Robin a chance to add anything if, if he thinks important. So um, it was clear from, from speaking to the managers that um, a lot of them look to the state to solve social issues. Um, you know, so solving a social issue is, is not necessarily something that an asset manager felt uh, that they had a, res uh, a definitive responsibility to be involved in. Um, you know, many of the issues were sort of countrywide, they were rather bigger than just an individual corporate, um, as opposed to the environmental factors where um, there is a very clear policy uh, policymaker guidance already. And on the governance side, that, as we explained before, is something that's very important to Chinese asset managers because of the, the, the preponderance of uh, founding shareholders or the state being involved in business. Robin, is there anything that you wanted to add to that? Yeah, maybe um, another thing is uh, related to the data side. Social factors is harder to quantify or to keep track of the progress. And, uh, you know, it has, you know, uh, you know, uh, it's, it has to, uh, unfortunately, it, it, it needs, you know, has by the, the, the nature of it, the, the issues, um, it's more qualitative. So, uh, so i.e. the managers, it's harder to gauge whether there's some real, pro real progress has been made. But uh, I think um, over a longer period of time, um, you know, uh, uh, I think uh, the, the the difference or the progress is more obvious, uh, can be more obvious. Okay, thanks. Um, actually, Robin, can I ask you to just move this slide one along because um, what we do have for those who are attending who are interested, um, we've actually the 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 survey itself has been released. <clears throat> um, there's a QR code on the screen, which is uh, an opportunity for you to try and uh, you can download it there and and, and have a look. Um, we do have another question. I'm not sure we, we know the answer to that straight off. We may have to go and do uh, check through some of the numbers, but uh, but a question that was, what percentage of the managers in China are able to provide full voting records across their portfolio holdings? Um, is it likely that it's only the global firms that have a China presence or do uh, the local managers, the local boutiques and the, the domestic mutual funds, do they also provide, do they record the votes that they, that they give? Um, I suspect they do. Um, but we may need to just go back and, and confirm that, Robin, unless you happen to know the answer or that. No, that's that's right. Yeah, that's right. So most most global managers, domestic um, and uh, the, the 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 larger domestic funds, you would expect them to um, uh, 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 more advanced in terms of um, uh, uh, more diligent in terms of proxy voting. Um, but as we show that, not uh, often. Uh, reported externally. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, we're kind of coming up to, to the end of the session. Um, so if anyone still has a, a, a burning question at the end, then you know, please send that through. Um, otherwise, um, it, it remains for me to just put this into a little bit of a wider context. Um, so I mentioned that we did a similar survey in the South African market, which is also available on our website. So if anyone has, hasn't seen that yet, please do, uh, do visit riscura.com and have a look for that survey. Um, but it's, it's our intention to, to, to make this one of a, a series of surveys, um, ultimately covering all of the key emerging market countries, the BRICS uh, countries. So um, you know, do look out for uh, additional research coming from uh, us in the future on, on this topic. Um, and uh, needless to say, if anyone wanted to discuss some of the issues that were raised today in more detail, then uh, please feel free to reach out to any one of us or uh, any one of the consultants that you might already have uh, uh, working, uh, working with yourselves. So with that, um, no more questions have come through. So um, I'd like to thank Robin for his, uh, his help in presenting this morning or this afternoon uh, in Hong Kong. Um, I hope it's been useful for everyone who's attended. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at uh, a future Oscura webinar. Many thanks. <laughs>